what if something goes wrong? This is a story that happened to me several times. Out of the many stories, I'm going to create a composite one. A story in which a parent, a mother, or a father, or both parents come to me and say, Pastor, I need or we need to speak with you. All right, what is it about? Well, Pastor, our children, your children, yes, Pastor. You know, Pastor, before they were even conceived, we prayed for them. That's wonderful. Yes, Pastor. Then before they were born, you know, we prepared the crib, we decorated the room, you know, how you do it when you're waiting for a newborn baby? Yes, that's all beautiful. Yes, Pastor, and then I was a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad until they grew up. That's quite a sacrifice. That's wonderful. Pastor, we paid for the best education we could provide for our children. Yes, that's remarkable, especially if you live in America. But pastor, I don't know. You don't know what. You know, we had all these dreams for them. We made all these plans for them. And it seems that all of those have fallen apart. My eldest is in prison. The middle one is a drug addict. And now the youngest left home. We have no idea where he is. Pastor what did we do wrong? At first, you know, because I started ministry quite early, around the age of 23, I had a hard time answering those questions. I'm still not sure I have answers, real answers for those questions, because if God's human family rebelled against their perfect father, their perfect parent, then you cannot blame, or at least not in all cases, the parents whose children rebel against their dreams or against their plans. But with time, I learned some of the dynamics that happen in some families, especially in Christian families. So, one of the questions that I usually ask when somebody comes to share their hearts with regard to their kids that rebelled, against their dreams and their plans is, listen, when you dreamt those dreams, when you planned those plans, did you ask yourself this question? What if, in spite of all those dreams, in spite of all those plans, what if something goes wrong? What if your children 
decide to go against your dreams, to go against your plans. And I receive two kind of answers. I've seen people that will tell me, yes, Pastor, we thought about that too. So, what was your thought about it? Well, we decided no matter what they do, no matter if they go against our dreams and uh, let our plans fall apart, we'll continue to love them. We'll continue to be there for them and we'll try to woo them back. But I've also encountered situations when they said, well, pastor, to tell you the truth, we did not think about that. I'm starting a new series from uh, the letter or the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. The letter to the Ephesians and indirectly or through the Holy Spirit directly a letter to us today. I would like to start with reading the first 14 verses of uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And I would need you to just follow through carefully and notice the two kind of expressions. I highlighted some expressions in blue and some expressions in red. We'll just read first, then pray, and then go on. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the time He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in Him. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you all so trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Amen. Just imagine that is one single phrase in the Greek. Let's pray. 
Lord, we pray that Jesus Christ will be lifted up and the Holy Spirit will work on our hearts and minds. Amen. If you followed the scripture, a long sentence, you could notice two kinds of expressions. In blue, you had things relating or related to the being and the work of God Himself. You saw words like will, choose, predestine, desire, words that have to do with what God does, how He operates. On the other hand, you could see four synonymous expressions in red. One is in Him. The other one is in Christ Jesus. The other one is in love. And then the other one is in the beloved. Four expressions that are actually synonymous. They mean the same thing. In Him, in Christ Jesus, in love, in the Beloved. What the Apostle Paul starts saying there is that he himself does what he does by the will of God. Does that mean God forces him to do that? Of course not. But it means that God really provides for whatever it takes for him to be able to do what he does. Because what he does is done in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 3, he emphasizes that everything, every blessing, every spiritual blessing that happens to us, happens to us in Christ. Blessed be the glory and the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Whatever blessing has happened and whatever blessing is happening to us, spiritual blessings, all those happen in Christ. Verse 4, that we should be holy. Why do those spiritual blessings happen to us in Christ? That we should be holy and without blame or blameless before Him in what? In love. See, in Him, in love. Just as, according to the manner in which, that's the meaning of just as, or according to the manner in which He chose us in Him, in whom? In Christ, in love, before the foundation of the world. Interesting what he says. Because what the Apostle Paul points out here is that before the foundation of the world, meaning before creation, when God chose a master plan for creation, for the creation of the universe, and you can imagine in God's fertile or creative mind, there could be countless master plans that He could then bring into action or into fruition. From all those countless possible master plans that God chose to bring into action or to actualize, He chose a master plan in which we were included. And now God's desire is that in Jesus Christ, we will be brought back, and that's called adoption, we'll be brought back to Him so that we will be according to the manner in which He chose us in Him, in Christ Jesus, before the foundation of the world. 
And how does he do that? Verse 5. Having predestined or predetermined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Yes? God, by Jesus Christ, wants to adopt us as sons, and that is called predestination. He predestined us. How does that work? One of my professors, Professor Fernando Canale, an Argentinian guy, he had a very funny story when it comes to predestination, what it means that God predestined. He said uh, there was this college student, very talkative. You know, there are those young people that can talk at any time about anything, just very talkative, very confident, self-confident. And he came out, he came up with a very ingenious, a very creative way of uh, now finding a wife. Because, hey, you get to that age as well. So what he did is he took the yearbook of the college and uh, sat down, went through all the names, and he created his own lists based on uh, his knowledge of the girls on campus. And he only put on his list the girls that somehow attracted him and somehow were appealing to him. So he created his list. And then he said, well, out of these names, one of them is predestined to be my wife. Problem was, somehow the list leaked out. And it got to all the chosen. <laughs> Poor guy. Hey, this wasn't me, okay? <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> you can imagine, none of the chosen really wanted to be predestined <laughs> to be his wife. Yeah, he, he was doing pretty good in the confidence department, but when it comes to looks, he had some challenges. And now to be predestined? Huh. No. Hilariously, many have this kind of uh, idea about divine predestination. Many believe God took a paper and created a list, a list for heaven. And arbitrarily on that list, he put the names of those he wants to see in heaven. So those that are predestined for heaven, no matter whether they want to go or not to heaven, they are going to heaven. Why? Because they are predestined to go to heaven. That's one list. But then he has another list called for hell. And uh, he predestined some people that he doesn't want to see in heaven to go to hell, put them on their list, and that means no matter what they want or not, no matter whether they want to go to hell or not, they will go to hell. Why? Because God predestined them to go to hell. Now, if you think I'm making this up, well, no. This is a famous theologian. His name is Jean Calvin. It's the Calvinistic double predestination, which says... That even before creation, based on this Bible verse, even before the 
foundation of the world. God made a choice. He predetermined, He predestined some to go this way, some to go the other way, and that's what happens. That's pretty fatal, right? But there's another very popular idea, probably much more popular here in America, according to which God only has one list, the list for heaven, and He puts all the names on the list for heaven. So in the end, no matter what, if they want to go there or not, no less volens or unwillingly or willingly, they will end up going there. Why? Because God predetermined their decisions, their will. And that's called Bart. That's his name, an Austrian theologian. Now, the question is, could God do this? Could He predetermine people's will, people's decision? Could He predestine people in a mechanical way, some to go there and some others to go over there, without their own choice, without being able to exercise their free will? Could God do that? I think He's got the muscle for that. He has the power to that. If He's omnipotent, in theory, He could do that. The, ca the question is, can He do that if He is love? Can He do that ethically? Somebody that in His fundamental existence, in His basic essential being is love, can He proceed like this with His creatures, even rebellious human beings? Because the great challenge is predestination versus free will. And many people see that tension as being irreconcilable. It's either predestination or free will. There's an anecdote about a group of theologians debating whether it's this one or the other one, and it got so heated that in the end they broke up into two very hostile factions, and one of them couldn't, just couldn't decide whether he wants to go with the predestination group or with the free will group. So he said, uh, listen, I, I, will, I will just think about it. So he thought about it, and then he decided he was going to join the predestination group. And uh, he went there, and when they saw him, somebody asked him, hey, who sent you here? And he said, no, nobody sent me here. I came of my own free will. Your free will? You don't belong to this group then. Go to the other group, to the free will group. So he went to the free will group, and when they saw him, one of them uh, said, hey, why did you decide uh, to come and join our group? And he said, actually, I didn't decide. I was sent here. You were sent here? No, this is, this is a group you only can join based on your own free will decision. So go back to the other group. But in reality, this can be a dilemma in some people's mind. How, how does this uh, predestination work? What does God actually do? Is predestination a predetermination of the destiny of every single human being, and what God pre-established about you in eternity, that's what is going to happen to you. If He decided you are going to heaven, you're going to heaven. If you, He decided you're going to hell, ah, that's it. No, predestination is not that kind of a teaching. Predestination in the Bible is not something 
that cancels out free will. Free will is something you can exercise, your choice, your decision, your freedom. Just imagine this. If God predestined the decisions, the will of human beings, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, was it Adam and Eve that decided what they were going to do? Or God decided for them. When Putin decided he was going to start a war, okay, I know that's can, that cannot be decided single-handedly or single-mindedly. But say, when he decided to start the war, was it him who decided or God decided for him? See where the problem is? So, predestination does not cancel out free will. At the same time, when we speak about predestination biblically, we are not speaking about providence. Let me explain the difference. Some of you that attended the Sabbath school from the book of Genesis, you've seen that God seemingly arbitrarily, because we don't know on what criteria, he chose Abraham. He picked Abraham and used him to become a great nation, and in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Why did God choose him, chose him and not somebody else? Why? We don't know. That's his decision. He has the right to, to pick and choose for people to do this or that in his plan for history. But that is not called predestination. That is called, what is, called, is it called? Providence. When God uses human beings in key situations so that his plans will advance through history. Predestination, according to the Bible, is like a plan, a blueprint, or a frame for salvation. Meaning, before the world was created, before the foundation of the world, God provided for the scenario in which something goes wrong in our history. And uh, this plan of salvation was included in God's master plan for creation. Because based on His foreknowledge, because according to the Bible, God has foreknowledge, not only that, all foreknowledge. Because He has that kind of foreknowledge, He knew what was going to happen. And because He knew what was going to happen, He knew what kind of a solution to provide when the thing that he foreknew would happen. I know now you can come with a question and say, Pastor Joe, if that is true, if God knew he foresaw all the mess, all the misery we are going to get ourselves into, if he knew how much suffering we will cause to ourselves and to him, couldn't he have decided not to create us? What do you think? Because I don't know the answer. I can, however, ask you a question. If you are a parent, a mother or a father, a loving mother or a loving father, the most important or basic characteristic of who you are is love, a loving mother and a loving father. If you foreknew that your children that you were going to procreate will rebel against you and create suffering to themselves and to you, would you go on and procreate? I'm not hearing answers. 
Let me repeat the question. If you, if you are that loving mother or loving father, and you know your descendants, your offspring, your children will rebel against you, will create a lot of suffering, a lot of misery to themselves and to you, would you still go ahead and procreate? Because if you say no, and I have a question for you, for those that have children, why on earth did you procreate? You didn't know your children will create suffering to themselves and to you as well? Or you never suffered because of your children? You understand the dilemma? So when we blame God for the mess that is going on on this earth, for the mess that is going on in Russia and Ukraine, and Eastern Europe, and possibly in the whole world. Because now we have gotten to the place where we are saying, hey, 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 I'm going to push the button. Don't push the button. I'm going to push the, don't push the button. Be good. How did we get to the place where the potential of self-destruction of this planet is, I don't know how many times, what we would need? To actually destroy ourselves. And this is a very difficult question. Why did God, if He foreknew all of this, even create us? If He is not love, because God is love, that's the basic definition, then I have a really hard time dealing with that question. But if He is love, then, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, makes sense to me, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Oh, there was something about grace that He wanted to shine in the whole universe by which He made us accepted or favored in the Beloved. In other words, this is the frame called in Him. In Him. In Jesus Christ. Or in love. Or in the Beloved. And that's the plan He made for us from eternity, from before creation, from before the foundation of the world. That we will be adopted back to God in Him, through Him. Because it says in verse 5, by Jesus Christ we will be adopted to Himself. And then in verse 6 it says that, it is grace by which God makes us accepted in the Beloved. And in verse 5, something is pointed out. Verse 5, that He does that according to the good pleasure of His will. It's not like God feels, oh my goodness, I have to do this for them? Oh, no. But hey, I have to do because in the end I'm God. No, no, no. It is His pleasure doing that. It's like the, the parent that sees his child or her child suffering and suffers himself or herself. And yet because of love, you would do whatever it takes to adopt, to bring that child back. Yes, you provide in your love for them, even before you procreate, even before you have them, you provide for them, just in case something goes wrong. 
to get them back, to woo them back, to adopt them back. What do we have in this, in Him? Verse 7 and onward. In Him we have redemption or liberation of a slave through ransom. He would go out and pay because you are now a slave, a slave of the enemy. He would go out and pay the ransom for you. And he explains what that means through his blood. He does that. And that means the forgiveness of sins. How? Watch this. According to the riches of his grace, verse 8, the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us, he lavished on us in all wisdom and prudence, meaning he knew what he was doing. It wasn't a surprise. It, was some, it wasn't something that, that caught him like that. <gasps> no. No, he knew in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 9. Having made known to us. So now he's making known to us the mystery. Yeah, that's a mystery. We, we cannot comprehend that. The mystery of his will. He reveals it to us. As much as we can comprehend it, according to his good pleasure again, which he purposed in himself. That, so what's the purpose? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, or when the times reach their fulfillment, he might gather together in one all things in whom? In Christ. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In whom? In Him. In Him, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in love, in the Beloved. That's what He wants. To gather us all together. Meaning He wants to reintegrate us in His big universe. And the whole universe will be again in the existential frame that we had before anybody rebelled against God in heaven or on earth. And then it goes on and speaks about our inheritance, our future benefit. Yes, now we are forgiven. We are forgiven. We are taken back. But it's a future benefit. In Him also, in Him also, we have obtained an inheritance or we were made heirs, being predestined according to the purpose of, his, of Him, who works all things according to the counsel of His will, verse 12, that we who first trusted, meaning the Apostle Paul and those in his time that already trusted or hoped in Christ, should be the, to the praise of His glory. And if His glory is His character, then it's to the praise of His love, actually. And those that already in those days believed or trusted, or hoped in Jesus Christ, they would be the glory, or they would be the praise of His glory. And then He says, not only us, in Him you also. And that's our message to the world today. That's message, my message from God for you this morning. Not only me, not only us. Those that already trust in Jesus Christ. Those that already hope in Jesus Christ. You too. In Him. In Him. In Jesus Christ. You also. After you what? There's a process here. You heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also. Having been. Having believed. So you heard. You believed. And you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, verse 14, who is the guarantee or the pledge or the down payment of our inheritance to or toward the redemption of the purchased possession of God, which, was, which is you, which is us, to the praise of His glory. Yes, in an existential frame, in which something went wrong, you and I, in Jesus Christ, 
in love, in Him, in the Beloved, we are the praise of His glory, which is the praise of His love to this world. Love that contains two elements. I repeated this and I have to repeat it again. We'll see it later again in the book of Ephesians. It contains grace and truth for humans to be adopted. Adoption is a, a, a very tricky illustration here. You know, adoption is not easy. I sometimes uh, have people tell me, hey guys, uh, we think we would adopt your children, jokingly of course. And sometimes I jokingly answer, yes, we have been thinking about that too. Just <laughs> and I see people look like, what's wrong with this, this guy? Now, adoption is not easy, especially if parents are still involved. Now, we are heading to a time uh, in a direction where people take people's children and give them into adoption forcefully. But that's a discussion for another time. But we are adopted, we are not forced back to God. We are adopted. In our specific case, there is a process. Because somebody else now masquerades as our father, the father of humanity. You know the conversation between Jesus and some folks in John chapter 8, when they said, we are the sons of Abraham. And Jesus said, no, 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 if you were, you would not. You have somebody else as father. And that's why adoption is needed, because somebody else says, hey, I'm their father. Yeah, but you don't see what's happening in Ukraine. You don't see this game with, I'm going to push the button, don't push the button, I'm going to push the button. I'm their father. And God says, in Him, in Christ Jesus, in the Beloved, in love, I want to adopt them. How? Well, first I call them. They will hear the truth, the gospel of their salvation. They will hear it. The truth and the gospel of their salvation. Grace. Grace and truth together. They will hear it. And they will have to decide. They will believe. Verse 13. Hear and believe. And then, as a result of their decision, of their believing, what they will do is they will be sealed by the Holy Spirit. God knows not everybody will want to be adopted. He knew that. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 22, verse 14. This coming Monday, I'm going to be flying to the Dominican Republic. I'm going there for a mission project. For some years now, I have been working as a volunteer project management for Share Him. Share Him is a mission agency established by Robert Palkember Sr. And that takes students oversee for uh, mission, for preaching, evangelistic campaigns. So I'm going to be there for two weeks and uh, doing my research to see what is going on there, I wanted to know if there are little islands around the big island. You know, the Dominican Republic is a part of a bigger island in which you have Haiti and the Dominican Republic, but I wanted to see if there are little islands around. I couldn't find too many. I found out they have a Catalina Island as well in the south, but I'm going all the way up to north, to the coast. But why was I researching for that? Because 
after we have that evangelistic campaign, we usually take a day to take those students somewhere to just have fun. And uh, three years ago, we went with a group of Australian students to the Philippines, and there we could do island hopping. You know, when you get on a boat and you just go from one island to the other. It was very fun because we rented a boat only for our group. The members of our group were predestined to get on that boat. Only the members of our group, all the members of our group were predestined to get on the boat. If somebody else wanted to come with us, because of insurance reasons we couldn't have taken, it was only us predestined. Is Jesus Christ like that? Mm -mm. If Jesus Christ is a boat, and this in Him, in Christ Jesus, in love, or in the Beloved, is the boat, then because God calls everybody, anybody can get on the boat. While on the boat, within the rules and regulations of the boat, they have freedom to do whatever they want in that existential frame of rules and regulations that God establishes. If they don't like it, they can even jump off. That's the plan of salvation. God did not predestine individual destinies. He provided the frame of rescue, of safety. These days, more than ever in our lifetime, we have seen how unsafe life has become on earth. Very unsafe. People in Ukraine are hiding in, uh, in the subways and in the subterranean bunkers. But can they hide? Is it safe there, really? I'm hearing about people that preach the gospel even in those places. And you know what the essence of the gospel is? Is that safety is only in Him. Because in Him, even if the bombshell hits you, the Bible says, blessed are those that die in the Lord. Not even those are lost. In Him, in Christ Jesus, in love, in the Beloved. Amen.